Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I am the founder and CEO of Product School. And today I'm here with Piero Sierra, who is the CPO, Chief Product Officer at Skyscanner. Hey, Piero. Hey, Carlos. Uh, great to meet you. Pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to have you. You know, one of my favorite things to do is to literally get to meet people who are building some of the products that I use every day. I've been using your product for a very long time to book flights and hotels. So, you know, happy to put that uh, to the name. Oh, Skyscanner. <laughs> well, let's talk about the, the beginning because uh, Chief Product Office is a big title for a big company as well. Uh, but how did you break into product? Um, well, I mean, I, I guess going going way back, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of I'm American, but I, I grew up in Italy and Brazil. And as a kid, I just, I, I love computers. And so I, I taught myself to, you know, write programs and games for fun, just for fun. But then, um, and then after that, I, I, I became a, a self-taught engineer and I, I did that for a few years uh, professionally. But then I realized kind of I needed a more solid computer science foundation. Uh, so from there, I went to a, a U.S. university where I got a degree in computer science. And then in 1995, I applied for a, a job at, at Microsoft in Seattle. And that was a great experience. But during the interviews, they, you know, they, they do a coding interview. They looked at my code and they said, you know, you should be a product manager, which I assume is a, a compliment. And then my code must have been so tidy and wonderful that they decided I should be a product manager. And to be honest, I had no idea what that was. I just thought I was going to code for a living. And they said, actually, uh, you know, you're probably better at PM. And so they pushed me into that career track. I didn't know what it was. And I also thought I'm going to do Microsoft for a couple of years and then I'm going to do other things because I just figured I'd get some good foundations from that. And instead, I fell in love with product and I fell in love with Microsoft too. Microsoft is a great place to be. And so I thought I would be there two years and I blinked my eyes a couple of times and 20 years had gone by. I literally spent 20 years at Microsoft. I, I made incredible friends there. I was, got married in Seattle, had kids, all that. I worked on great products and things. I, I you know, Internet Explorer. I, I guess that's defunct now, but that used to be a product. You might have heard of it. Uh, and then I worked on, on, on Windows and MSN Messenger and uh, a product called SkyDrive, online cloud storage. All that was really fun. And then when Microsoft bought Skype, uh, you recall, and that must have been like 12 years ago or something, but I, 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 I moved to London because Skype was headquartered in London. So I moved to London to run the, the, the Skype product team here. And that was a ton of fun and a great education because Skype was, was a true startup uh, in the sense that Microsoft obviously was not. So I kind of got a taste, taste for that. And I, I really fell in love with kind of that startup approach, mid-sized mid company approach to things. Um, after, after Skype, I found my way to Skyscanner. Uh, and obviously the product, a great product, but I really fell in love with, with the company and the culture here. Uh, Skyscanner is just this kind of vibrant US style startup uh, in travel, but it has an eye to Asia and the different ways of doing things. And it has a very, it's a very ethical company. It's got very good uh, kind of European, if you like, ethics and uh, always putting the traveler first and our partners first ahead of, even ahead of revenue and things like that. It's been very interesting, especially in an industry, the travel industry, as you know, is, is not entirely 100% trustworthy. So it's nice to be the good guys, and it feels really great. Uh, so that's kind of what brought me here. Um, and yeah, that's what I did. So I have to ask this question. You said you spent 20 years at Microsoft in different roles and different products. Now, when is th that moment where it's like, okay, now you're going to switch gears, you're going to join a way smaller company. Like, what was the status of the company uh, Skyscanner when you joined and what was your first title there? Uh, I, I, so Skyscanner was uh, uh, well-established. So it was already a startup that had, um, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 million users at the time on a monthly basis. It was a, it was a popular product that people used, especially in Europe at the time, it was mostly European based. Uh, the core functionality of Skyscanner was very good, but the product was not. The experience was not connected at all. It was very disjointed. It was just, it was just like a really good backend piece of code with a lot of A/B testing UI on top of it, and no brand, no story, no connection, no consistency, and a quite a limited feature set. So I saw, but I saw the team, and I saw the team is so much better than the product. I can maybe help the product a little bit. 
as, and I, when I joined, I joined uh, Skyscanner as a, a senior director and then became a VP and then eventually a, a chief product officer. So that was the path there. I, I must say that Microsoft might, uh, you know, and maybe as a career advice or for other people that are doing this, I look back on my 20 years at Microsoft, it was, it was an amazing time and I don't regret it, but it, it was too long. And I feel like I probably should have moved on sooner. I saw, you know, your city, for example, you've had so many different experiences and I've really only had, I, I consider them three. And I, I don't feel like it's quite enough. And there were definitely several years at Microsoft that felt the same, like I'm doing the same thing, I'm doing it well, but I'm not learning as much. And so, and it's always hard to uh, jump into the deep end of the pool uh, and try something new. Uh, I'm, I'm a conservative guy, so by, by nature, I don't jump as much as, as other people do. I'm, I'm very, very jealous of people who are just like, every two years, they're just like, let me reinvent myself. Let me try something completely different. That's not been my path, but, but I would recommend that path to people instead of mine. It's obviously, you mentioned that when you broke into product, it was almost by chance because your code was, you know, and they, they, let's put it this way, that the employer had a different expectation. I'm also a frustrated software engineer. And like, how does someone go from being a, a good individual contributor in product to eventually lead product teams as a chief product officer? Hmm, interesting. How do you scale up in that sense? Well, the the great so the the key definition of, of product is the product is a leadership function within you know engineering which is about building things and so and leadership is is a thing that you sort of there's a, a core that you probably have to have and that's probably what Microsoft signed me I you know I joke about my code not being as good as other engineers I'm sure that's true but I also think that they did see something in me that they said actually this is somebody that probably could be a reasonable leader. And the thing about at Microsoft and other companies, and, 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 us, and I think it's common in the product journey, is that we take very junior people that are actually just coming out of college, but we put them in leadership positions almost from day one. Like most, for example, most entry level product managers will work with seven or eight engineers from day one. And those engineers can be like, you know, 15 year veterans with tons of experience that know how to do things. And somehow that product person is still supposed to lead them, not on everything, it's a, it's a partnership, but they are saying, this is the problem space and this is how we're gonna approach this and these are the priorities, et cetera. So it's, 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 it, it's the officer core in, in the army or something like that. You're looking for leadership. And obviously there are people that naturally demonstrate some of that and other people have to develop it. And there's so many different leadership styles and probably there's some selection bias that happens there as well. But, and then, so that's the entry level. And then in terms of, of uh, you know, moving on and getting promoted and, and getting to eventually bigger and bigger things. Um, well, there's so many different aspects of that. Obviously it's about being good at the job and, and doing it well and being successful. Uh, it's also, I think about maybe finding that balance between being a, a, a good leader, but also finding ways to subsume your ego, if, if you understand what I mean by that. Because you, you, you want to be able to, to set direct and guide people, but you don't want it to all be about you. And I actually think that the people that are able to get results and lead uh, you know, groups of engineers to deliver great things and have good market fit, et cetera, but that aren't, it's not about them, but it's always about the team. I find that they get promoted more often. And at Microsoft, and the, uh, you know, the one thing I used to say at Microsoft, uh, thinking about it, because I spent 20 years there seeing multiple people go from intern to you know VP, basically seeing people promoted, getting people promoted across that path. And one of the things I kept saying was, it, it, the, it, it, the justice will prevail in time. Right, like the good people will rise to the top, and you know, there might be one promotion cycle where something unfair happens. Somebody doesn't realize that you were actually the key contributor for X and Y, or and somebody else gets promoted that you think, Well, that person's a coconut and I'm better than they are, whatever it is. And obsessing over that, it just is actually a negative spiral that will slow you in your career, as opposed to if you're able to just push that down, not worry about that, focus on results, and focus on making the people around you great. I know that's corny, but I actually think, at, at least in the companies I've worked on, that actually works. And I like that perspective, especially in a, in a world where it's a lot of turnaround. And, and as you mentioned, some people are uh, switching jobs very often. I, and I really admire 
people who are here for the long game, who are focusing on like really a, a 10 years from now type of outcome, who are optimizing for a big win, not just for themselves, but for their team. And I agree with you. I think product requires to put the ego aside because in a way we're on the sidelines, right? Like these days we have engineers, designers, marketers, they're supposed to get credit when things go well. And in a way, I think we should also take responsibility when things don't go so well. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so what does your day to day look like? Um, well, so in my case, uh, I lead uh, a product and our, our design team is actually brand and design uh, team. So it's a very large team. It's about 150 people. And at this scale, uh, my job is mostly organizational, right? Setting broad direction, organizational structure, staying aligned with the board, staying aligned with my executive peers, setting targets. But actually, I, I try to think of my job as much as possible as setting things up and getting out of the way, you know, getting out of the way of the product uh, leaders and the design leaders who should be making the real decisions of what we go do. And I know that that can sound a, a little corny, uh, but getting out of the way and, and actually more importantly, keeping the rest of the company out of the way uh, can be quite a hard balancing act. You know, we'll have some revenue target, you know, revenue was soft this quarter, so we want to hit that. And the board wants you to hit that, and the company wants you to hit that, commercial team wants you to hit that. And it makes sense, you want to do that, but actually you have a product or a design team that is saying, we need to go slower to go faster here. We need to invest. It's going to take three quarters for this thing to fly. But once it does, it's going to be great. Here's why it's going to be great. We have, the hypothesis is valid. We've tested it. It's real. But you just need to give us nine months to get this done. And so creating space for that to happen ends up being a, a lot of my job. I also sometimes joke that my job is saying no, right? Like 90% of the time, it's, it's, it's no. And then 10% of the time, I get to say yes to stuff. Um, so that's, that's a lot of it. Uh, and, and then, of course, you know, uh, thinking about strategy priorities and, and the OKR planning and execution process is a big part of my day. But you, you mentioned 150 people, team, and not just engineers, but many different functions. And, and we've seen that there's not just one playbook. There's so many different ways a product team can be organized. So how do you think about different org models and what have you found successful for you? Oh, well, that's a great question. I, I, um, I, I'd love to hear your perspective on that question because you probably have been exposed to even more organizational models than, 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 than me. I can tell you at, at, at Skyscanner, we, we thought long and hard about different models. We actually evolved our story here over multiple years. But the, the core thing that we've done is, uh, first of all, we've organized our engineers into squads and then our you know, squads into tribes, pretty standard stuff. But the, the challenge then is, how do you match that to the business, right? And because there's many ways to organize a B2C business. You can organize it by channel. So you should have somebody looking at apps, somebody looking at webs. You can organize it by software layer cake, right? Backend, middleware, and then UI layers on top. You, you know, you can organize it by business. In our case, we have uh, flights, hotels, and cars, and I guess advertising are the, are the four big businesses of Scanner. So you can imagine an organization that looks like that. And so you have all of these possible dimensions for how you organize a business. And you need to figure out the right ones. I've actually, in, in our world, we've taken out channels because you can't think in four dimensions. So the, the main thing to do is to pick two of those and to say like, uh, you know, in our case, for example, we organize ourselves by, uh, by, by, by uh, channels, uh, sorry, not by channels, by journeys. Uh, so top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, and then by platform. And if you can flatten the dimensions, you can create an org structure that can resist strategy changes because the, the problem is your strategy will change every six months and things will come up and you want to come up with an organization that can kind of resist uh, and support any strategy you like without having to be completely redone all the time because reorgs are help. At our scale, you know, we have you know, 1,600 engineers. It becomes really, really hard to reorganize folks. So we really try not to do that. So that's, that's, that's the model. We explicitly chose to go away from a GM model. You've probably been exposed to this. I, I'm allergic to that from Microsoft. Microsoft has, uh, you, know, the, you know, the famous org chart diagram where you have in an Apple's case, it's Steve Jobs in the middle and everybody. Microsoft is like all these different islands with guns pointed at each other. This is the old Microsoft, by the way. Things have changed a lot. But when I was there, that's very much the model. And so I, I tend to think that uh, 
orgs create walls and you want to try to think they don't solve problems they create problems right like it, I, the best org is no org just we're all sitting around the table coding together but at a scale you can't do that so how do you design that we've been very allergic to uh fiefdoms and uh individual leaders we try to do everything discipline based uh, and everything so everything so for example all of the pms regardless of what uh team they work on or what tribe they're part of report up into you know chief product officer all the engineers report up into the chief technology officer etc we try to keep all the disciplines separate that model's worked pretty well for us actually i'm quite excited about that model at scale um but there's other models that can work as well of course so can, can i yeah. take this question to you what have you seen and what, what do you think is what are some top so ones? I start to see some patterns because I, I love asking this question. I'm a, I'm a nerd when it comes to uh, behavioral organization. And and I've seen, first of all, there are certain classics that still stick, like the Amazon two pizza team approach, like really breaking down teams into small squads that you can fit with just two pizzas. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I've seen more and more companies using the approach of the, the customer journey rather than the channel, because in this world where everything is kind of omni-channel, it's Really exactly. hard to assign a user channel. Yeah, now, exactly. That brings okay. We tried to do the channel thing. So, for example, we tried to have a team that was like the app is a channel, and we're just going to have a team that owns the app end to end. But the problem is, first of all, like you said, the customers are on the channel. They search on the web, and then they come into the app. They do a booking. Maybe while they're traveling, they use a different system. Maybe they're on a friend's computer. They're still trying to sign in, see the same data. And then for the teams that are thinking about the journey, how do I get a customer to move further down my journey, engage more with the things that we have to offer? Those, those people found it very, very hard to then say, well, now I have to go to the, I don't have any app engineers, so I have to go to the app team and ask them to do something for me. So we, we don't do that. We've organized ourselves um, uh, really by, by, by journey. And of course, the platform team. So there's a data team for everything. There's a supply team for everything, et cetera. But that seems to work quite well for us, actually. Uh, and again, it's a scale thing. At, at some point, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, if you're a company the size of a Microsoft or an Amazon, it, it's just that probably becomes impractical. I hear Amazon actually, uh, sorry, Apple really does this at scale. I haven't worked at Apple, but I hear that they have disciplined leadership all the way through the company. I don't know how real that can possibly be given the breadth of the company, the number of people, the number of projects, but, uh, I don't know because also they don't share much. <laughs> so it's really hard to get. But one challenge that I've noticed with this approach, which is more focused on the on the customer journey rather than the channel, is that there has to be a strong partnership with marketing teams. Like it's really hard to define a line in between what is marketing versus what is product, what is product marketing. So how do you think about that? Yes. So uh, I think if, if I had an answer to that, I would I would be so happy because that is absolutely a, a, a fundamental problem that everybody struggles with. And, you know, the, I, I'll start by saying what I believe is true, but I have not achieved personally. I know that some companies are a lot closer than we have. We're still struggling on this journey. But the, I believe that, that uh, product and marketing are actually not different. In, now, there's different specialisms. So you're going to have marketing people that are very good at marketing, product people that are good at product, and designers good at designers. But the product is the thing that should be marketable. So uh, what is the difference between answering a question for the, tra in our case, travelers, right, because we're a travel company, on Google for SEO and answering it on our product? If you ask, uh, you know, who flies from, from London to Miami, if you type it into Google, Skyscanner has an SEO page for you that will say, here's, who, here's the answer to that question. But if you go to, to the product itself, you ask that question, you get a different answer in a different format. And so, for example, why, why are our SEO pages not our core product pages simply you know, put onto a dedicated URL that Google can read, right? And so can those things come closer together? Or think about merchandising, like the merchandising activities, which is like a, in, in a given market, you want to talk about certain things. Like maybe in one market, we want to talk about insurance. In another market, we want to talk about, hey, at some domestic sale option. Or in another market, we want to talk about hotels. So, you know, the merchandising for how we talk to customers has to be deeply embedded in the product. Or think about the, the go-to-market activities. So you're yeah, typically a lot of what used to happen at SkyScanner a lot actually was that the product team 
would come up with a great product. They would do a bunch of experiment problem space, uh, uh, experimentation, double diamond. Then they would ship an MVP. Then when they would get, they would A-B test it. It's working. This thing, it, it looks really good. And then when it was done, they would go to the marketing team and say, look what we did. Please market it. And the marketing team would go like, are you nuts? This is not, like, it's not designed to be marketed for stars. You missed, you know, I don't have a unique URL. I don't have a way to, you know, there's all these missing tools that I have. And then it doesn't fit into the narrative that we're trying to talk about from a marketing perspective. And so trying to bring that together is the ultimate challenge. What, we're, what we've done at Skyscanner to get closer to Nirvana, but we're not at Nirvana, but what we're doing to get closer to that is one, to make sure that there's only one engineering team. There's not a separate engineering team for product from marketing, because I think that can get you in deep trouble. Uh, we actually used to be that way, and we ended up building a lot of marketing technology that had to be thrown away, and product that couldn't be marketed. So we, we have only one engineering team. That's number one. And then we actually have a, a PMM, a, a product marketing manager function, whose job it is to connect these two worlds and to stitch them together. So, for example, they, they manage, like, how do you do a good market properly? So there'd be a PM thinking about some problem, and a PMM will go to that PM and say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Let's connect you to this marketing person. Let's figure out what's happening in Brazil right now and try to stitch that together into something more coherent when we actually launch it. And PMM is a new function for Skyscanner. We've only had it for about a year, but it's working well, and we want to double down. So I used to, we used to have PMMs at Microsoft. It's a, it's a powerful function that's done right. And it's a very it's special so, kind of person in BPM. That's a whole other conversation. Totally. I agree. It's so powerful. I, I wish I had learned about this earlier. I come from an, as you as well, from an engineering background. Uh, I, I was under this impression of like, well, uh, PM, good PMs need to write code. And now we're seeing this transformation around like, good PMs really have to write copy and really understand the business side of things and the user more than, or not just the, the technical aspect. Yes. I, I, I would say there's there's many kinds of good, there's so many different paths into product and so for example there are obviously like you said engineers that become product managers there's marketing people that become product managers sometimes there's like the entrepreneurs that become pro most CEOs are effectively product leaders or not all but in tech they tend to be uh, and then there's even now you're seeing a lot more like data scientists and people with a, a strong data background become product managers and so sort of naturally they will all bring with them their, their prior knowledge, and that's the lens that they will apply. And so, if you, know, if you come from a, a computer science background, an engineering background, and you're a product manager, you probably need to do a lot of learning and marketing. So that's what we focus on. Don't you know it, that that's probably the next. If you come from marketing, you probably want to learn more about the software development lifecycle and how to work with engineers to get things done and try to close those gaps. Because uh, no, there's you know. I don't think there's any unicorns that just show up with all of that knowledge. And in a company, it's good to have that diversity too. Like, so just to be clear, you know, we have uh, several, for example, technical product managers that oversee an API that that's totally fine. They're very good at that. And, you know, you don't need them to go design UI and work with design or figure out how something should be marketed and work with the marketing team. So the specialism can be useful. Yeah, and it's great that there are options these days. It's like there was a, before it was like, okay, the product manager is like almost the only member of the product team. And now we're seeing how diverse this is. And first of all, yes, there are a lot of different types of PMs, but there are also a lot of people who are part of the product team who, who are not just pre PMs. And I think that's great. An example would be PMM, but you know, we can talk about uh, program managers, business analysts, data. I also consider honestly design and engineering and even marketing part of the product team. Cause as you said, this is a team sport. It is a team sport, and that, that, it, this connects back to your point or your question around organizational design and how to do it. Because if, if you're going to say that you have a discipline-based model, which means that you know under the CEO, there's going to be a number of uh, chiefs for the disciplines, and the reporting lines go vertically down from those people, that means that the only place it actually all comes together is at the CEO. The, right? Whereas if you have GMs, each, each, each GM is like a little mini CEO, effectively, right? If you're going to say you do it discipline-based, and you're going to say to make anything happen, you need to have, uh, you know, a, a product person, a marketing person, a PMM, a designer, obviously an engineer, leader, whatever it is, and it's the team sport, then you really need to search for people that are great at collaborating and working together and turning off their egos. 
because if not, it all falls apart because if you have two of those people, let's say a marketing person and a product person that can't, can't figure out a way to solve a problem or resolve it, their natural instinct is to go up a level and escalate it. But in a discipline model, that just escalates all the way up to the CEO because there's no, it, it doesn't come together in some smaller point. So, and that, that's why the GM thing is so tempting. So many companies are tempted to say, it's too complicated. I just want one person who will decide everything. And like, and, you know, so uh, in our case, I just want one person who will own flights. And, you know, so I don't have to worry about hotels. I don't have to worry about the app. I just want, but it doesn't actually help. And um, so instead what we do uh, is we, we really, really focus in our hiring process and in our development process on finding ways to collaborate together on the team sport piece, on turning off our egos, and uh, and we're very allergic to that. Like one of our key cultural, um, and we're not the only company, of course, to have this, but we have a, a very high degree of allergy towards uh, self-centeredness. You know, we, our, our core value at, at Skyscanner is, is travelers first, then partners, then Skyscanner, then team, and then me, in that order. And if you can't get with that value, then you know it's probably not the right company for you. And there are other ways to be that can be perfectly successful, but that's how we choose to do it. And um, Piero, what are you excited about learning these days? Oh wow! Uh, well, it's interesting because uh, the problems I'm most passionate about align well with our mission. But given that I get this more or less set the mission with my exec peers, that maybe is not a coincidence. Uh, our mission is, is to lead the world to modern and sustainable travel. And, and that those, it's, there's two things, modern and sustainable. And what we mean by that, those are the two problems that I'm most interested in these days. So the, the, the modern one, what I think of this as kind of, um, uh, first of all, how, how, how primitive uh, travel shopping is compared to almost any other form of shopping. You know, if I asked you to pull out your phone right now and order a, a 46 inch TV. While you are talking to me, you could probably get a TV, figure out the reviews, uh, you know, just in the background, like with one hand, you could probably figure everything out you need, click buy, and it would show up on your doorstep tomorrow. And if you don't like it, you could return it, right? Like buy with one click and all of that through the obvious merch at the Amazons, but other merchants as well. It's just so easy to do all that e commerce stuff. But if I said to you, you know, book a flight to London, you know, right now with your phone, just pull out your phone and book a flight to London. There's no way that you could do that. And the truth is that technology has um, turned us all into travel agents. We all have, you know, it's been great. Like we all, you know, we all have all these tools, whether it's, uh, you know, Expedia, Kayak, Skyscanner, whatever, Google. You can just find all of this inventory and all that. But how do you, this huge dark side, which is now you spend eight or nine hours planning stuff. You can't book everything in the same place. You don't get consistent service when you do it. So in some senses, I, I mentally want to turn back the clock a little bit to I'm old enough to have used the travel agent. You know, go to the travel agent, say what you want, get great answers, get a couple of choices, and then take care of the rest. So uh, heading more in that direction is interesting. And doing that in a way that is scalable and still part of our business model that's far. The other big problem that I'm interested in sustainability, um, I mean, you know, travel, travel is, is a force for good in the world. It brings people together, it removes barriers, it prevents wars, it's commerce, it's all those things. And we love it. It's just a, it's a, it's a human thing. Uh, but it comes with a huge uh, ecological uh, downside. I mean, that's obvious. And even I, I have to tell you, when I was interviewing for Skyscanner, I loved the product, but I was hesitant to join a company whose role was to, you know, success for Skyscanner is put more and more people on more and more airplanes for less and less money. Right, that's success, and, and, and that's good for business, but for the planet, that's that's not so good. But luckily, I found um, a very like-minded team at Skyscanner uh, that was deeply aware of the impact of travel and, and trying to do what they could to improve things. And so we've now we've now said sustainability isn't isn't just a CSR corporate social responsibility for us, but it's actually our mission. What can we do? With, with software in our position in the marketplace, you know, we're basically a search engine for all of these travel things to really encourage uh, some more sustainable travel. Can we teach people what is better, what which choice is better than another choice? You know, this flight actually, because it flies, uh, you know, it's it's a short haul that flies shorter than this other flight, or it's a specific airplane, a model of aircraft, or it's this percent pool. All those things affect 
how much um, you know, CO2 it's going to emit. So can I teach people to care about this and choose those things? Because if I can, then what I can do is I can go to the suppliers and the airlines and I can get them to create more supply. It's like a little bit like, um, you know, we all love organic food now, but we have to be taught that organic food is better. And we have to be taught to prefer organic food, which costs a little bit more. But if you buy organic food, and then the suppliers are like, whoa, these people are paying more. And actually, you know, I, I can save on, on, on pesticides. So the suppliers stepped up and made more organic food, and that's a, that's a cycle. So what we're trying to do in Skyscan is to learn about that cycle and see how much we can contribute to the industry and kind of push that forward. And that's a very, very new space and a very hard space to actually do anything with. Uh, but it's fascinating, so I'm spending a lot of time on that. Well, I enjoyed our conversation and, and I love your leadership style and, and how you, you also lead with, with your heart and with purpose. Um, I believe it's important for the long term and also for the next generation. We all care a lot about how things are made, where they come from, and like kind of what's the long term vision behind. Um, is there anything as you would like to say to you know, aspiring and entry level PMs who are looking up to you thinking, oh my God, you know, he's done a lot of cool things. I would love to be a CPO one day. How can they kind of accelerate their career? Well, um, yes, I think I'll go back to the point I made at the beginning of this, which I think is still true, which is, look, you know, join a company and don't worry about getting promoted. If you spend your time thinking about getting promoted, that's almost certainly, and managers hate that, but you know what they hate? They hate the PM that comes in and instead of talking about all the problems that they've solved, they talk about like, you know, how am I going to get promoted? Make me the checklist. What is the tick, tick, tock so I can get to the next level? Like, it actually hurts you. It slows you down in your career. So if you can, ignore titles, ignore rank, ignore layers, especially in a bigger company. And just, just if you find something that you believe needs to get done, go and make it happen. Ask for permission, not for forgiveness. You know, just push it through and, and try to let go of your ego a little bit and not take yourself this seriously. I, I honestly think that's good career advice. I, I, it certainly worked for me. But thank you so much. Um... Yeah, let's keep building cool products. And um, thank you so much for your time, Piero. Wonderful, Carlos. It was great to meet you. Cheers. I mean...